so that all happened in like 24 hours uh, basically yeah. oh my god so like yeah pretty yeah. crazy <laughs> and as far as any kind of realism or subgenre of realism this is the more ethical way than yes. finding google references because you still need a realistic image maybe it will get to the point where you can just say make me a tattoo design with this for this part and it'll be perfect but right now it's not you still have to do a lot of work to it i get it but like i think i'm like a soul surfer when it comes to tattooing i'm just like I, this is why it works for me, and I can explain why it works for me. Hey everybody, we're here with Sarah Fable. Get to know her story. She's been around in the industry for a long time, so let's hear about it. I wanna take a second to talk about Allegory Ink. I've been using Allegory Black Ink for some time now, and it's been the best black ink I've ever used. It's really consistent, really black, and I haven't used anything else since. They also have ultra black if you need that extra punch. Use the code EDEN20 for 20% off your order. Hi. Hey. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so where where did you come from? Why are you here right now? Oh, like in life in general or just like sure. where did I come from five days ago? <laughs> sure. Where do you live? How did you travel here? Um, so I live in Los Angeles, California at the moment and I yeah. tattoo on the west side mm -hmm. um so flew here from yeah. there and okay. then originally born and raised in finland but i lived in australia new zealand and england so that's why the weird accent yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do people ever ask where you're from and can't yes. pinpoint it all the time all yeah the time. wait so how long were you in finland um so when i was 11 13 and 15 i lived the summer in england and then i left permanently when I was 18. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. So you're like pretty much raised there, grew up there. Yes, yes. Born and raised in Finland for sure. Yeah. Got it. And you've been, um, you've been prominent in the tattoo industry for a long time. I know the first time that I ever heard about you was when I was an apprentice. And um, I, I feel like for a while you were like, like a tattoo model, but your work started showing up, your illustrations and like, really started following you for the art that you were doing. Um, I'm just kind of curious because I never really heard like that whole story of how you got into that tattoo <laughs> industry and, and made it, made yourself so prominent. Um, what was that journey like? So I studied to be an art teacher. So I was teaching primary school and high school. And then I'm, when I moved to Australia, um, I was studying, I was working in a nightclub and then my free time I, I was just illustrating mm. and how I got into the modeling was um, my first visa had ended in Australia and I went to New Zealand with only $300 and in New Zealand mm. you can get a work and holiday visa same as in Australia if you are under 30 years old so you get a one year visa to work and do whatever you want so I went to New Zealand and honestly I didn't have even money <laughs> to get um, a phone plan so I would go to wow. McDonald's for the 30 minute free Wi-Fi. And there used to be this website called Model Mayhem. I was so lonely. I had nobody to talk to and I couldn't text. I couldn't even text a friend during the day. I'm in a new country by myself. I'm living in like a room without a bathroom on the basement of a motel, not a motel, a hostel. So I would go and like wow. find local photographers. So I ended up working with um, this guy, he was there filming Spartacus and a girl who ended up shooting for, well, she was shooting for the Vogue in New Zealand. So they were like, yep, we'll do some practice shoots with you. And then from there, um, I started modeling, mm. um, just out of like boredom and need for human interaction. And <laughs> that took off. And then because I was one of the first users in Instagram, when it was still in its like testing phase. So I got in there super early and it just kind of blew up and wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so in that phase, were you, so were you tattooing yet or no, you were I just wasn't. getting big on Instagram for modeling? I was getting big on modeling and then the illustrations, the drawings I was doing. And then um, my first apprenticeship lasted <laughs> one day. <laughs> and then I freaked out about the tattoo industry a lot mm -hmm. and um, didn't get back into it until I moved to Melbourne mm. 10 years ago. And I reached out to two shops. The first one was absolutely no. And the second one was Daniel Sharp. 
and he was the email back from him was so sweet he wasn't like sleazy he was just like oh hell yeah and like <laughs> it's funny because i was here yesterday and he like messaged me and it was like are you in texas and i took a video of the shop so it's like Aww. like people always like talk shit about their apprenticeships but like i was just so grateful and yeah. he was so respectful towards me and that's mm -hmm. like a lifelong friend now yeah that's awesome wow. so this that's was cool. 10 years ago yeah. and then so how how long was it between the one day apprenticeship and your real apprenticeship like three years okay so you yeah. were like completely don't. turned off yeah. from the tattoo industry i am just curious what happened you don't have to <laughs> tell if you don't want to but what made it a day so it's really weird because there's two stories to it so the tattoo shop that i ended up getting my first apprenticeship i didn't know that this guy that i had like seen was their other apprentice that had been there for a while cleaning but didn't really have artistic talent so they weren't allowing him to tattoo versus I went there um, and I was like these are my drawings and they were like we're gonna hire you on the spot as a tattoo artist like basically you're gonna fast get fast tracked from the apprenticeship so I went there and then and this is where it gets really tricky so one of my friends he was gay came in to like congratulate me and then I heard like all these the talkatory the Derogatory. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Derogatory. Yeah. Derog <laughs> that word. Um, comments about him. And I was like, okay, that's really weird. And then I hate this. And then my boyfriend was going to come and pick me up. And like, we were in the, we lived together and he was black. And so like, and I was like, maybe like, the, I'm getting this weird vibe. Maybe don't pick me up. Like, this is really weird. And then the following day, I got to the shop. And one of the guys who worked there was like, you need to get the fuck out. Um, the owner doesn't want to see you. You need to get your stuff. You need to leave. You, he like doesn't approve of you. So like I got this whole thing that the shop was like a neo-Nazi shop. And like because of my friend circle or my partner, like I needed to leave right now before he even gets there. because He was going to beat me up. So I was like, okay, hell yeah. But like I don't need to tell me twice. So fuck. I left and... But then like years after he hit me up and he was like, oh, that was so weird that you like just left. And I was like, cause I was told that you were gonna beat me up. And he was like, are you fucking kidding me? So apparently, and this is where I'm like, I don't know what story to believe. But the second story was that the guy that I had been seeing and his friend didn't like the fact that I was getting fast tracked to tattoo and they came up with this whole scheme and they got me kicked out before the owner got to work so that they could tell him that I just bailed. <laughs> so, wow. I, the fuck? <laughs> so that was my one day of apprenticeship in this industry. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But then you got a good apprenticeship. Yeah. So oh, wait, so, so that all happened good. in like 24 hours, uh, basically. Yeah. Oh my God. So like, yeah, pretty yeah. crazy. <laughs> I can see wow. how you'd be like, yeah, this is insane. Yeah. And no, yeah, what, whatever happened is still a crazy story like and who, also you know? like to put a little bit of context tattooing in australia you're tattooing most likely under a gang so like 10 years ago shops are owned by biker shops which you had the element of like certain viewpoints yeah. to certain things and or your shop you owned it but you had to pay protection money or have like the relationships with the gangs that controlled the area so I knew, for example, like a lot of tattoo shops, when you quit tattooing there, you either break your own hand or they will break it for you so that you do not work immediately to another company. Like that was very common, like fire bombings to shops were common. So the culture of tattooing was very closely tied to criminality. So even when I did get the apprenticeship with Daniel Sharp, that was a gang shop. It was mm. owned by a gang. Mm. like that was just my reality is for me to be like they're gonna beat you up I was like well that's a common practice that happens actually a lot it wasn't like yeah oh she's overreacting it's like no that's the culture what did you do for the three years in between that day to getting a new apprenticeship I'm just like <laughs> I don't know fucked around not yeah. like in that way like just like I mean yeah. like didn't <laughs> yeah, just yes, like yeah. I know like I mean like I just tra I just traveled and did stuff like like oh, yeah did drawings <laughs> um right off the bat you had this etching look to your illustrations how did you come up with that style what drew you to that um I've always been really interested in the 
I'm not religious, I'm an atheist. Mm -hmm. And I always found like the Old Testament and the stories and like Dante Alighieri, John Milton very inspiring, the whole idea of like heaven and hell and damnation and shame and like shame of humanity and like shame of who we are and mm -hmm. like, we're gonna bring forth the end of the world because we're selfish creatures. So um, I was inspired by the old religious woodcuts because when book printing first started, all the books were mainly Bibles and reli like religious yeah. texts. Yeah. That's where the money was. So yeah. the early images depicted that. So Wow, yeah. wow. Um, did you draw them like with microns? Did you use any kind of like references what was your drawing process back then and then what's the difference of what you do now um because you still my crowns have, like, once like yeah kind of. my crowns once i had money <laughs> and everything else like the cheap ones before that but yeah marker pen like marker on yeah paper. and for the people who don't know what a micron is not me <laughs> do you want to explain what a micron is for everyone else it's just a very expensive good quality pen marker pen that you can yeah. choose the tip a marker oh, okay. pen is a yeah. good way to describe it yeah a what pen a marker pen is a gotcha. good way and it's like a micro like micro gotcha point yeah. and so now the difference is do you use an ipad do you use a wacom like what is your process now when you draw these because it's still kind of similar style although i guess it's i feel like it's more realistic now like a rather than complete illustration so i think i still have a lot of i have a lot of repeat clients i have a lot of clients from years ago when i did the etching like because i also did dry needle etching which is a little bit of a different technique that came later mm -hmm. on in history mm -hmm. so i started with the woodcut style thicker lines and then i went into the very single needle super detailed work um and I still have clients that want to have that. And for the line work based designs, um, I draw them by hand on paper, like just pen wow. and paper. Old school. Yeah. And it's a very loose sketch and all the detailing and the shadows and all the shape comes from my head as I tattoo. So when clients are like, can I see the final sketch? I was like, it hasn't happened because it'll happen on the day as I tattoo because I don't even know how it's going to look like yeah. until I get there. Yeah. Um, but for what I'm now known for is my black and gray illustrational realism. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to mimic the feel of a pencil drawing mm -hmm. or like kind of how Da Vinci we used to have those like etching like those books where he would like sketch things and mm -hmm. ideas. So that's that's the style I'm like going for. It's not like realism, realism, mm -hmm. but it's more like illustration realism. Yeah. And I feel like you really focus on texture more than in anything, whether it's texture in fur or ropes or whatever. It's like, that's, I feel like that's a pretty main focus for you. Um, you, you, I know you kind of mentioned a little bit yesterday's AI and stuff. How have you incorporated that into what you do? So as a kid, I was like that weird nerd that just loved like sitting at home on the computer. So I was a gamer and just like, honestly, I just like, I like my computer and it's my safe space. And I, so like doing stuff with AI is like my happy place because mm. I get to like hang out. Yeah. <laughs> and so I do use Mid Journey a lot. Um, it changed how I draw and my how I design and the main reason why I started using it, and this is where the whole conversation about AI, whether like you're stealing from another artist is, I just create reference banks. So if you go on my computer, you might have like folder for women and folder for animals. And then within the animals, it's like felines, horses. Mm. So I'll just like hang out with my cat and just create reference photos. So instead of going to Google mm -hmm. and taking the picture of a horse that 50 other people are going to have. I have my own references of the horse. I'm not necessarily like taking a design style from another somebody else. Yeah. I'm just creating like black and gray references of certain things. And then I put all of those together. I still have to Photoshop them together. So none of my AI designs mm -hmm. are where I like 
tell the whole story to AI. It's more like I have the puzzle pieces that I then artistically put together myself. Yeah. Got it. So there you have references and sometimes you kind of, I don't know what the word is, mash, podge. Photoshop? Hodgepodge. Hodgepodge. You kind of hodgepodge different mashed references potato. together to make like, it's <laughs> because you did a longhorn yesterday. Was that like a bunch of different longhorn references you had and you put them together or, or did you create that whole entire image just by itself? Just by itself. Got it. So cool. Um, with my client, he loved Lamborghinis. So he was like, I want a bull. But the shape that he was wanting wouldn't fit his arm. Mm. So for me, um, I just like wanted to have like still the element of the bull charging, but having it more of an um, elongated design that fit his forearm rather than like a horizontal one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just created, I think I created like six different bulls that I all liked. Mm -hmm. Out of those, I sent two to him, and I was like, here, which shape do you like better? And then we agreed that we liked the one shape better, which I did too, and that's how yeah. we did it. Yeah. But that was a simple one. That was just a bull. A lot of my other designs are like multiple different elements and ideas. In yeah. It. Um, and it's cool too, because I find that uh, I... When we, when we did a collab together, you're like, bigger the better, and that's when I really like felt like I started trying to push bigger, bigger, bigger. So you can take um, these elements, and it's a few, but you'll you'll make them as big as I can to where like and can fill up space and wrap and flow and stuff, which is uh, really cool. I wish um, more people who are listening can maybe implement that in their work too. Just thinking, yeah. how big can I make this to fill up the spot and make it wrap and flow? around the arm and I think with the AI because I see these oh my god the ads are so bad where there's people like that are like influencers but are not tattoo artists they're just influencers with tattoos and they're like oh my god I designed my own tattoos now using this program and I'm like please don't create these AI designs where you're like you put like 10 different things into the um what do you the prompt, the, the prompt yeah. like Poseidon and mermaid and, and then he creates this hodgepodge like a nightmare image and then you go to your like tattoo artist and it's like I want this because yeah. that still doesn't work yeah um yeah. and even for the tattoo artist to try and create a like a full piece just using the AI sometimes it works sometimes it's great but you don't need to take that big of a shortcut just creating your references that you built the image based on is is like great yeah well that's why it's called like a reference photo and not like a tattoo design so yeah. um and i feel like all the good artists that i've seen in the studio use ai like that's just a starting point like nobody like takes that ai image and like tattoos from it like they they hodgepodge it they tweak it or even just use that for for inspiration and, and put it with other things because um There's it's a like lot of imperfections too yeah yeah. yeah. And so you still need to know how to draw and mm -hmm. like you like it's it's not really I mean, I guess it is a little bit of a shortcut, but it's not like taking the easy way out. Like I think some people might think it is because they don't realize like maybe it will get to the point where you can just say, make me a tattoo design with this for this part and it'll be perfect. But right now it's not. You still have to do a lot of work to it. Far from perfect. We always use tools like from way back in the day when if you love Vermeer or Caravaggio or stuff, they use camera obscura, you know, yeah. there's always tools that artists use and it's always been controversial and you're either on board and you try to use the tools given to you or you sit on the internet and complain about it. You know what's it. funny though is it's, it's almost more work to get a good AI image than it is just to scroll Google or Pinterest to find one. Yeah. You and know? Like, like you said, it's like, it, you can you can have the best ever Google image reference and the best ever AI reference, but how you have to still have the eye, whether the lighting's good, whether the shape's good, whether the image is dynamic and how it fits the body. Like yeah. just because you create it on AI doesn't mean that you're automatically gonna technically tattoo it well yeah. and it's gonna look good. Right, yeah. and, and it's still like designing on a square canvas. It's not thinking about a 3D body part. Yeah, so. yeah and that, and 
that's another reason why I think it's cool too, especially when you have like realistic animal references. They're not all going to be positioned the right way. So if you can use that to get better positions, like you were talking about the bull, then that's going to make for like better tattoos. Um, and I, I guess one of the things that people don't like about AI is they're like, oh, it's taking like credit from artists without, or it's taking whatever, it's taking references from artists without giving them credit. Are you a master at using a three round liner? Or do small needle groupings and details scare the shit out of you? Either way, we've got a great seminar for you. We'll be having Dimitri Troshin for a hands-on seminar here at Eden, October 13th and 14th. Dimitri pioneered the three round liner only movement and he's a very frequent mentor and teacher. This seminar is gonna be two full days. First day, he'll explain how he does his tattoo design and stencil process. He'll go over some principles of academic drawing that can directly apply to your tattoo techniques. He'll also go over how he takes great pictures and edits them quickly. Finally, you'll warm up for day two by doing some practice exercises on fake skin. The second day, Dimitri will critique some of your tattoos and discuss how you can improve them moving forward. You'll then watch Dimitri tattoo on fake skin while you tattoo the same design. He'll walk around to each of you and help guide you through the process step by step. At the end of the day, you'll also get some homework so you can continue practicing and working on your skills. Now, Bishop Rotary is also going to be providing the same materials Dimitri uses every single day. So you'll get the chance to practice with the exact same equipment Dimitri uses. At the end of the seminar, you'll also have the opportunity to purchase the machine and needles at a discount. Whether you're looking to perfect your three round liner technique or just looking for another skill set to add to your tool belt with a fresh approach, this seminar is for you. It's going to be an incredible investment to your tattoo career. Now we do limit the spots in these seminars so each person has as much one-on-one -on -one time with Dimitri as possible. Spots are first come, first serve, so don't wait. Again, it's gonna be Sunday and Monday, October 13th and 14th here at Eden in Dallas. Visit EdenBodyArtStudios.com slash edu to get all the information and book your ticket. Solid. How many tattoo artists put in the image when they tattoo like a photograph from Google, like yeah. a photograph by X, Y, and Z? Because that's what the most recent lawsuit with Kat Von D was. She tattooed yeah. the portrait. Yeah. And yes. then the photographer was like, you can't use my reference images, but like when it's AI created, it's individually made for the client. You're that particular image. It might be a mixture of hundred images on the internet, but you're not taking anybody's intellectual property when you're doing that. Yes. Plus, mm -hmm. um, even when we draw, like we're looking at the seminars that we just did it, it in, Edu, 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 edu. <laughs> and <laughs> like, even in those, like the guys were like, look, like I look at references and I get inspired by other people's work. Like mm -hmm. as humans, we early on as when we we're born, we start in taking the world around us and we start morphing the information that we're given through visual cues and hearing and then making our own. There has never been art that has start it without having inspiration from somebody else. Yeah. And so that's the other argument that people make against it is like, oh, it's just taking inspiration from all these artists without giving so them credit. Are you. That's <laughs> how literally every piece of art is created ever. Whether you're like consciously influenced by somebody, like your your art is the conglomeration of like your creativity, but also like everything that you've ever consumed. And probably yep. like all other forms of art that you've consumed, whether you recognize like, okay, this is the exact influence in this specific piece or not, it's coming from somewhere. And you yep. can't give everything you've ever seen credit for that, you know? And as far as any kind of realism or subgenre of realism, this is the more ethical way than yes. finding Google references because you still need a realistic image. Neo trad, tattooers trad, you know, some, some people, they draw everything from scratch and then which is amazing but yeah the subgenres of realism you need references and yeah. would you rather get it from google and other people's intellectual property like you said or create something on ai where it's yeah. it's no one's and if you stealing. get it from google it's going to be a tattoo that somebody else has like or there's no way that that hasn't been tattooed a million times before uh, the lady face that you are using might belong to somebody and i have seen a lot of tattoos with my face and i went to a convention <laughs> and there was a very lovely gentleman who had like this like snake demon lady and i was like and he saw me and we just looked at each other like he's like that's you <laughs> <laughs> i was like Yes. Yeah, you're it was like an old photograph. You're a great reference. When I was an apprentice, I used your face as a reference oh, for a 
ta for like a tattoo I did on pig skin just to practice color realism. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. I'm sure your face is on a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even even most like uh neo traditional artists though, like even if they're drawing, like most of them will trace a face. They might edit it and stuff like yeah. that. But it's still get inspired. To me I, AI is like a good thing. Um not necessarily because it makes the process easier because like I said, and, and then you have to learn how to like tell it to give you good references. Cause if, if, if I go to AI and I just type in something like it's going to give me shit, like you got to learn how to talk to it. Mm. So it's a learning curve there. And then again, once you get the stuff, it's not perfect. You've got to tweak it. I think the biggest benefit is just more original tattoos and better tattoos, you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 And then you showed us like a video the other day that you made with AI, right? Yeah. So older I get, more I consume other people's social media where I'm like, I'll see my fellow tattoo artists on a road trip and I'm like, oh my God, I feel like I'm part of this. I love seeing these videos. But then when it comes to me producing content, like putting myself out there, I'm like, nobody's going to see my face. Nobody wants to know what I'm doing. And I was so ashamed of putting myself out there that I actually got myself scanned and made into an AI avatar where I can like, we could do this podcast, we could scan ourselves sitting here and we could make unlimited amount of podcast videos of us sitting here. And all you have to do is like type in what you want the avatar to say and like the mannerisms and the voice, everything matches, but you're not physically sitting there. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. What was, what was the video? I can give it to you. You guys can stitch it with this. Yeah. 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 I'm so curious. And, and what app is that made with? Um, my friend owns the company that they're like producing it for, but like I don't want to give their trade secrets out. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I do that. And then I use AI in other ways too, like 3D scanning things. And then I took a photo with John Nelson. <laughs> There's an app that I love using that changes your facial expressions. So I was like, I know he looks grumpy and sad in every photo. And I was like, <laughs> I like stood next to him and was like, I'm just going to put a smile on him. And he's like, that's so creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, see, you're having fun. That's wild. Do you think uh, eventually AI is going to take over the world and be self-aware? Absolutely. And there's like a couple of um, people that have said that they have found self-aware AI at the moment, but that's also a discussion whether or not like it was just a well-learned model, like a behavior model or whether it was a sentient AI. Yeah. Um, I do believe that we are going to cross that barrier where whether or not it's going to be sentient, but it is going to. And also, let's go to like a weird philosophical thought right now. Go for it. To an extent, we are a model of our behavior that we have learned from learning from others. So, yeah. and we think we make decisions on our own, but our decisions are also a sum of things we have learned and how we understand the world to operate around us. So true. How is that? Like, where does the level of sentience to just a learned behavior model? start and where does it end and where if we have a good enough learned behavior model where the computer or the AI creates these decisions based on what's learned how does that technically differ from us mm -hmm. so I think the determination of what is sentient is also just something that we're going to have to struggle with in the future but not to go into those rabbit no, holes no that's but super deep and super interesting <laughs> Yeah. I, I always say, like, we're the product of the five closest people around us. Yeah. But that, of course, with childhood trauma and our past experiences. Yeah, no, but I mean, that's... But that's it's very true. It's very a interesting. Good point. Yeah, not not even, like... Uh, yeah, I, I love that quote, and we take personality traits for sure, but, like, yeah. your, I guess, your social coding or whatever you want to call it, your ethical coding, like, yeah, some of it's inherent, but a lot of it's the conglomeration of just every experience you've had with other people like and just for your like whole life yeah. a lot of it's evolutionary psychology which is just like basically like years and years of programming some of it is like we carry like the flesh carries the memory kind of tech, tech 
like and DNA and things like that. But like technically we can if we can train AI to do that and it's making all these decisions and it's making conclusions on its own. Like, and then we get into this like future philosophy world where it's like, well, what is a soul? Like, do you, what determines a soul? For the longest time, we believed that when you had a dog and you performed surgery on it without any anesthesia, that the dog was whimpering because it was a natural reaction that the dog didn't understand, but it wasn't actually technically feeling pain. But that was just like the same as if you touch one of those touch plants, the leaves close, that it's just a chemical reaction that gets caused yeah. but later on we were like no the dog feels pain the dog feels fear but for the longest time that wasn't even an option so like mm. our ways of looking at things are like grass like why does lawn smell the way it does because there's a distress hormone that is the lawn em emitting hormones and chemicals not hormones but chemicals that signify to the surrounding that they're in stress so maybe in 10 years we can say we didn't know that there's a type of nerve ending and the p plant mm. felt fear or pain. Yeah. Like mm. we just don't know that. Like the dog experience was very recent and now looking at it, it's horrifying to us. Yeah. So right. I think the levels of what is a soul, what is a sentience and what is like true intelligence is gonna be more very soon mm. due to AI. How did you, uh, how do you do your research and find all this out? Is it like a Google, like, do you go down a rabbit hole or do you read certain books or? Um, yeah, I, I also love um, when you post a design about something like horses and you'll post like question polls that are like yeah. very scientific, like quizzes about mm -hmm. the animal or whatever. Yeah, so you seem like very smart in that <laughs> regard. Like you just do a lot of research on that stuff or? Um, so I read a lot. Um, like, for example, like, when the Eden ED was happening, um, I also just have, like, I get it from my dad. It's ADHD. Hello. And <laughs> I, sometimes it helps me to do multiple things at the time. So, like, for example, during, like, the seminar, I can, like, basically recant, like, is it recant, like, re recite the yeah. first lecture like almost work by word too but i was also reading an article about like transcranial stimulus like current stimulation and like sound waves in regards of like the dark um procedure of like learning and then like about marcus nerve separation because i was like wanting to talk to somebody about the subject so i just get really excited and <laughs> i just like will read we'll find a topic and then i'll read the studies research like from that and then I'll have like a Google on the side to like understand certain terminology and words and then I read the articles and mm. and I just re retrain memory a lot so like welcome to the world of useless facts but <laughs> sometimes you can use them that's awesome yeah so what what was your biggest take from that article that you were reading during the first okay <clears throat> so um, did you know that there is a, a way that you can enhance your learning at least twice the speed? Mm. And that's a protocol that I, I, I have the machine. So mm -hmm. early on, the insurance, my insurance approved me for a type of like electro stimulation of the brain. Never went and did it. Um, but yeah, that sounds kind of. It's, Sounds kind of scary. <laughs> it's not. It's been around for a really long time. Okay. So, like, current stimulation of the brain is very, very well known. There's not a lot of side effects. And when the military started testing it to teach their cadets to learn faster, especially when it comes to, like, motor function and focus, um, they found out that you can increase learning at least by double the speed. So it is a basic device with two electrodes one goes in one part of the head and then the other one goes in your shoulder and then you usually do 20 to 30 minutes very low current stimulation and it stimulates your neurons stimulates the brain area and it helps you to create pathways so if you think of like let's think about anxiety for example mm -hmm. it's like a football Done. field <laughs> it's like football field so there's multiple players but if you have trained yourself to be scared in traffic, for example, driving, 
you when you have the ball on a football field, you want to throw it to the closest person that's going to be a clear shot because neurons want to create that easy pathway that's there. So if the closest player to you is the player that is screaming traffic anxiety and like mm. it's the closest and you throw it to them, that's what your brain's going to do. It's like traffic anxiety, traffic anxiety. But you can retrain your brain and it takes so much effort, but you can look at the guy closest to you screaming traffic anxiety, but you see the dude behind it and it's a longer throw and it's most likely an iffy throw, whether that, whether that electric impulse is, or the ball is gonna go all the way there. But with practice, you can avoid the screamer and throw it further out. So like cognitive behavior therapy, yeah. repeated patterns. So you can do that with a lot of different things, but with the electro current stimulation, it's almost like when you're about to th throw to the other bar person and you throw it to the further person, the electro current stimulation helps you to focus that throw further and it dials in the way you throw it to them. So that physical bridge that starts happening to your brain starts bringing the screamer further out and bringing the person that you want to shoot the ball to closer to you and eventually those two players shift places mm. and your preferred pathway becomes the healthy player mm. so like what are the, what are some things that I was talking about that helps you throw to the healthier player exactly so cognitive behavior therapy and Got certain it. things like um, and this is where like ketamine treatment and mushroom treatment mm. they say that you're like it treats your brain to like look for the outside potential connections so because mm. like we're so stuck in like but that's the player that's like the closest to me and they're screaming really loud and it's just easy for me to throw it to them with like psychedelic therapy for example like your brain goes like i'm able to block that and like calm for a second and be like what other players what other option did i even have yeah mm. um and with the electro stimulation people it, it's been used for medical illness medical mental illness yeah <laughs> like it's a medical illness too so, just <laughs> illness. Yeah. so it's like <laughs> mental illness um schizophrenia it's been used for certain things like if you have like um muscle issues like for example like if you're getting a full hand transplant one of the things that it's like people have hard time understanding is like how do i would how would i even like move the hand because it's not my hand so you can like practice like understanding where you, even your muscles like contract and that with the ex expedited like learning methods what it does it's like you have one of the electrodes in your hand and the other one in your head um, and they did this with sharpshooting like training people to be snipers and they found that they were able to zone in the micro movements of the muscles of their arms mm -hmm. and how they fired because um, the electric current helped them like when they knew how to dial it and they shot, the brain registered that this was the exact right um, pathway of movements and the electricity mm. helped to dial it in. It's like like having oh. a post-it note yeah. that was like, you did correct, but now we put super glue on the back of the post-it note and it's like, God damn yeah. it, here it is. It's wow. sticking in. Wow. That's fascinating. And you, le <laughs> you learned all this reading at the symposium the other day um i have read about it before but okay, because gotcha. i was like um me and john were talking about it so yeah. i just like um because i used the electrodes in a certain way but my electron system is like i look like a total freaking like nutter because you have to put this like electro map cap on and then you like just taping these like <laughs> like hospital electrodes on yourself and i know that there's like a headband that's really sleek, but the electro placement, I was just trying to find scientific um, research papers on the variety of electro placement and I couldn't. And then I just realized that my device is better, but I was just like nerding out on it and yeah. then talking about Vargas nerve. So ju I'm just curious, but do you ever do like research on tattooing or like the science of tattooing? <laughs> no, I mean. and also like if somebody wants to correct me on what i just said feel free because that's just like my understanding of everything um like um yes and no because like 
so I love tattooing and I don't know why I do things the way I do. I obviously know what I'm doing, but I don't know why I know what I'm doing. Mm. And it's like Franco tried to explain to me like basic things like stroke and I'm just like not not the brain stroke, but like stroke yeah. in the machines. Right. Yeah. And I'm just like, uh-huh. Okay. I still don't know what a stroke is, to be honest. Yeah, and he was like trying to do like the whole <laughs> baseball terms and I'm like, I get it. But like, I think I'm like a soul surfer when it comes to tattooing. I'm just like, I, this is why it works for me. And I can mm -hmm. explain why it works for me. But to go, like, I do understand like, like, this is your cell. This is how like the tattoo needle goes in there. Yeah. This is how e ink work. This is the molecules. So I guess I do know like yeah. about the science behind tattoos, but I'm not like. It doesn't interest you as much as learning about the brain and nerve connections. Or we can go into any, I love fungi. So like we can go to any other subject, but tattooing is just like chill soul surfing yeah. for me where I'm just no, like. That's, that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I also feel like there just aren't as much resources out there on like tattoo science. I think it'd be cool if there were. I think it'd be super interesting. I don't think there is so much science to it as we'd want it there to be. Yeah. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that people have, like, researched it long enough. Because th we have these debates in tattooing, like, does realism last or do, or do no outline tattoos last? And I wish there was, like, more than just, like, anecdotal evidence of, like, oh, yeah, I've seen it for 10 years. I wish there was, like, a breakdown of scientific processes of, like, no, it is or it isn't like this because this is what your body does. Be nice to have a black and white explanation. I yeah, think be super cool. <laughs> so when it comes to that, I think the problem is that there's too many variables. So you can't actually research it because yeah. the, in order to do that, we would have to have like one tattoo artist that designs the same design on multiple different skin types and then you mm. follow it for like a 10, 20, 30 years. So mm. unfortunately, the problem is everybody tattoos differently. Even if you tattooed the same image for 10 years, your technical ability has changed and the variable has changed and we no longer yeah. have like pure data whether the design stays or doesn't mm -hmm. because you as the subject performing the tattoo has changed. Yeah. Right. So there's no way of having like concrete evidence and data on it. And unfortunately, like instead of like, like quantitative, like X amount of says this, blah, 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 blah. It's all going to be like qualitative. Like, yeah, totally. Uh, where it's like personal experience and this is what this and that. Because like you and me tattooing is like, oh my God, look at those tattoos that you did when you first started. And I'm just like, Oof. <laughs> <laughs> and like some of them are great, but like we've learned so much. And like, I think for us, like even in the symposiums, like, every person gave a different advice of how they tattoo. Like one person is going to be like, don't do this. And the other person is do this. Yeah. So it's like, it is so individual. And like I was trying to explain earlier, it's like, I know what I'm doing. I know it works well and I'm still learning to how to be better. But that's the same with the other artist, Like, like Avihu, Edith, Mike, like, yeah, like all of those people, every single one of them knew what worked for them them so even if the other person's method is correct they might not be able to make it work yeah yeah th and there was also a lot of discussion about skin types at the symposium and how you approach like different kinds of skin and like edit has very specific like i will only tattoo this part of the body because i know that's where the tattoo looks best so yeah it would be very nice mm -hmm. if there was a black and white answer in scientific research but yeah it, there's infinite variables on and then they're constantly changing. Even if you do the same tattoo over time, you're going to do it differently. The person's skin is going to be different. So And the aftercare, like how yeah. would yeah. we like yep. be able to, like, yep. if you say somebody like you're part of this research of how does black and gray age in 20 years, you would have to give that person 20 years of lifestyle limitations. Mm. Make sure that they put on lotion yeah. every day. They're constantly hydrated. They're <laughs> exercising. Yeah. You'd it'd be babysitting for 20 years. Yeah. Someone yeah, donate their tattoos and body to tattoo science, please. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> apply somebody. lotion five times a day <laughs> for 20 years. Uh, Keep it good. Okay. Just sarcophag of just freaking lotion. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. The vast majority of tattoo artists need to be better at something that's critical to each and every one of them. 
And that's of course the business side of tattooing. I'm Colton James and I'm stoked to announce that I'm hosting a tattoo business webinar at the end of October. Since I've been in the tattoo industry, I've worked with all different kinds of artists from apprentices to world famous tattooers. As a tattoo artist, one thing that they all have in common is that they all essentially own their own business. Even if they don't own a studio, they have a product and a service that they need to refine and sell. This online format is gonna let you tap in wherever you're located. It's essentially gonna be a crash course in tattoo business. I'm gonna be covering a lot of important topics like client correspondence, the booking process and setting your rates, how to build your portfolio, social media and other marketing tools, how to keep your finances organized, how to delegate non-tattooing related tasks, and way, way more. Everything I'm gonna be covering is gonna be dedicated to saving you time, making more money, spending more time tattooing, and making the time that you do spend tattooing more enjoyable. Now, every single one of us in this industry, myself included, has a lot of room to grow in all of these areas. So whether you're just starting in your tattoo career or you own a studio and you're crushing all of your goals, this seminar is gonna be for you. Not to go like too into it, but one of the things that, one of the most interesting things from the symposium is, you know, you've got totally ends opposite ends of the spectrum with Mike who does like the most like his presentation is called solid tattooing and it's like the most solid it's like get that color in there super Simple. clean and then you've got Simplified. edit who's almost talking the entire time or I mean half the time but with her like uh, her underpainting she's like she keeps saying like delicate barely touching the skin like barely get it in and then with the color she puts it in there more but I think um, I think people look at new styles not everyone but some people look at it very negatively of like like it's um some kind of scam or, or ploy and then edits up there and you know people are asking her questions about aging and she's like no i want to make it last a long time because i know that everybody's looking at me mm -hmm. so it's like this i don't know but I also like how honest she was, too. She wasn't afraid to be like, this has been around for about 15 years, and it's something that we're going to try to figure out. It's, yeah, it is yeah. fairly new-ish in the industry, but we're just trying our best. Yeah. That's <laughs> the other thing, too, that annoys me a little bit about the tattoo Asian conversations because that kind of tattoo is so new. Mm -hmm. You, So you, you can't say definitively, like, it's going to look great in 20 years. No. But you also can't say definitively the other way because you, there's no research right. of that, of those tattoos being around for 20 years. And may, now they're starting to be because it's been around for a while, but it's not a large sample size. Mm -hmm. Like you said, every artist, every client's going to heal differently. So, And it's also subjective because what does it mean for a tattoo to look good in 20 yes. years? And that's my biggest thing. It's like, oh, it softens, and some people are like, oh, it's not as solid as, like, this trad rose, and it's I like, know. yeah, but that, w why does that mean that it's not good, though? But it's also, if you look at the trad rose, mm -hmm. and you look at how it started and where it's now, like, the outline on the trad rose is, like, three times thicker now. So yep. it's just, like, and you might not know it because you had the thick outline there, but if you look at, like, next to each other, that rose changed as well. Yeah. And also, like, my tattoos on me, is like that woodcut style, very, like, fine line and stuff. And mm -hmm. some of, like, my knee, like, there's a rose and the line's blurting, fully blurting together. But it's also just, like, as you age, you look at all those old sailors that got their tattoos, like, they'll, mm -hmm. they're lived in. They lived with those tattoos. They experienced life with those tattoos you look like these people have gone through it and i think that's beautiful like mm -hmm. why does it have to look new and shiny why can't we just like accept the fact of aging and things yes, changing exactly exactly and I, I think the only variable that is the same is that you need some kind of black and that's it just for it to stay yeah but it doesn't mean that just because like if all the color fades or it softens or blows up, it ages. Like, who who said one looks bad, one looks good? Yeah. It'd be one thing if a tattoo completely disappears. You need some kind of black in the tattoo, I think, just for at least a skeleton or just something to stay so you can see something in 50 years. But, but who's I have to say what's that, bad or good? I have clients that don't want that. I have clients that ask for the microrealism. And I usually send reference images like this is another person's tattoo that they did. They're very well known, microrealism artist, charges <laughs> ten times more than I do. 
here's their tattoo fresh on their Instagram, and this is what the client like tagged them like three months later. And you can see 70% of the ink is gone. And I straight up have clients that are all like, I don't care, that's three months after. I just wanted to look dope. And I'm like, you're willing to pay this amount, and you know in three months it's going to look like this, and you're super chill with it? Okay, let's go. <laughs> like, that's on you. Like, fair enough. Like, am I going to feel embarrassed if they go and show it to their friend and say blah, blah, blah? But I'm like, I can show the proof that I told them it's not going to look good. And if you really want to pay me for that, sure. Like, maybe I should say no, but I'm like, you're either going to come to me and I can try and make it the best I can and try and make it last, or you can go to somebody who's less knowledgeable and less straightforward and honest with you, and they're, maybe they're going to do a worse job. It's like, why, and also, why do people care so much about what other people want to do to their body? Yeah. Ooh, I, I'm going to be worrying about so much more when I'm 50, 60, 80 years old. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be wondering, like, Oh my God, does my tat look sick still? <laughs> I'm just going to be. I'm All excited of the different <laughs> plastic surgeries I can get in the next 30 years. <laughs> I'm sure the technology is going to like full face transplant. <laughs> full face. <laughs> just, let's go. All right. So you're uh, moved around a lot, but you're in Los Angeles now, but you, you were in Portland. I was in Portland while, for a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. And how long have you been back in LA? Six months. Is that your home? For the... I missed it. When, before mm. I lived to Port, left for Portland, mm. I was in this weird place. Like, a lot of people say, like, they hate L.A. and it's super toxic. And I was in that same mindset. I felt really isolated, very used by people, and just, like, that nobody was genuine. And then I went to Portland and realized how much I missed L.A. and, like, the variety in people. And I don't mean, like, sexual and racial norms now. I mean, like, the variety and way of thinking and the intellectual conversations and the people that were authentically living their own path and even if you didn't agree with it you had the most interesting inspiring conversations with these people like I went to an event and listened to a 22 year old savant oh, young gentleman he talk about he created drones that he now sells for the US government to fight the war in Ukraine and like after the fact like we all went for dinner and it was him and like this is other guy who owns a robotics company and just like the conversations we had in technology robotics and battery technology and like artificial like skin and joints and things it was just so just i felt so alive and mm -hmm. those conversations i can find very easily in los angeles but i've had a really hard time finding that elsewhere mm -hmm. and when i did move back to la i realized that how I chose to have the relationship with the city came solely from how I chose to represent myself and have my boundaries. Mm. And since coming back as a different person, I really fell in love with that at LA and I just mm. love it. Good. And you made friends and people that you feel more connected with that you can have these conversations with and yeah, yeah, good. So, when did you move to the U.S.? Because you so so you said you started your tattoo apprenticeship like ten years ago in yeah. Melbourne. So I had a very short apprenticeship in Australia, and then I got deported and I moved here. So I've been here for ten years now. <laughs> so how? Yeah. Hold on. How, how did you get deported? Was your visa just up or? Um. So I got married, and my husband went missing, and it's it's still missing. <laughs> So I got divorced while he was missing. This is it's another story for the includes like plane crash and Bam Bamagera, so <laughs> that's a whole different thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so a whole different story time. <laughs> um, why did you leave Finland? Um, I didn't belong there culturally. Okay. So in Finnish we have a saying mies a ekapusa, which means the Finnish man will not kiss you nor talk to you. The what? The Finnish man will not kiss or talk to you. Why? What is what does that saying mean? <laughs> it's just because that's how Finnish men are. They're just grumpy, silent, <laughs> <laughs> introverted, just like, and like I am. Besides one person in my life, I've not been attracted to like how gen people that look genetically like me, like blonde eyes, blonde eyes. 
blonde eyes. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like blonde blue eyes. Um, yeah. They did have an exception, but but it's just like it just wasn't for me. And like the whole culture is very sad and dry and cold. And when I moved to Australia, I was really confused why people were happy. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so so I that's when I realized that it's like surrounding yourself, like you said, like the five people around you. But what do you do in the whole culture around you is like a certain way. Mm. And that's why I couldn't stay in Portland either, because it was like victing olympics mm. and i'm like i want to be around people that celebrate successes successes yeah yeah rather than like victim olympics <laughs> like victim olympics where it's like who has it worse is the coolest kid in the group and i'm like no like why can't we just like push each other to be better so like that's also yeah. what i love about la it's like it's so much like everybody's like doing their own thing and like trying to be better yeah. well what as of right now what are you currently doing what are your current goals Any plans I'm so scared or putting it out in the universe but if you want to talk about it of um, course. I met somebody not too long ago that inspired me to write again mm. and I used to why am I so embarrassed admitting that I wrote poetry <laughs> but oh wow yeah. So like, you're getting into poetry again? I, you, at the yeah, moment? again. And yeah. like just writing and just being sappy. And I think <laughs> it's like that I still identify as a goth. Yeah. And that gothic romance that's just like sweet but like heartbroken. And like it's the gothic yeah. romance. And <laughs> I just feel really inspired. So maybe I'm going to start writing again and doing that. and just I think this is my summer of making new friends and mm. being happy and traveling and just being here like all these people that are like Sarah I've known you in the industry for so long and it's nice to meet you finally mm. and like <laughs> I feel like I made so many new friends just coming here guest spotting mm. I connected with a lot of the girls that work here Good. found so much inspiration and the other people Good. in the in the Eden Edu, I just, yeah. this is what I want to do this year. Focus yeah, on this. that's awesome. Because you're kind of like, I think when we set up this guest spot, you were doing like a road trip or like a big national trip, right? Yeah, all the time. Well, <laughs> just, yeah. So like, um, I'm just, I really want to travel because I, I just want to connect with people. Yeah. 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 And you're heading to Austin after this? Yeah, so my flight leaves at 2 something. Oh, I'm okay. to Austin. Uh, my friend Dylan Forte has a tattoo ranch there, so I'm going to go spend a time with him and his wife, Jay. Ranch? Tattoo ranch. What is that? It's like acres of land with like, he has these crazy like glass triangles that you can sleep the night and watch like under the what? stars and like. No triangle class, no triangle class pyramids that you can sleep in. And like, it's like this like ranch in the middle of their like big plot of land. And you can just like go get tattooed in nature in like the hill county in Vimberley. Whoa. Yeah, yeah we know what really. Yeah. Wow. That Very is cool. so cool. Very yeah. cool. Are you going to write some poetry out there too? It seems like a nice place. Are you going to ever like publish or post any of it? So, you know, threads. Yeah. You know, Instagram. So yeah. I made my threads account into like where I try out my poetry, but mm. I'm so embarrassed because English is not my first language. And I think I need to do like an English course to like understand how to use like black, like know, just basic grammar stuff. Because I'll post something and I'm like, I need somebody to proofread it because mm. I make like small minuscule mistakes that I don't realize until I post it. Yeah. Mm. Well, you so. do great for it not being your first language. Uh -huh. Even like the way you write on your Instagram and stuff is really Thank profound. You. I feel a little verbally handicapped sometimes yeah. trying to speak a language is not mine, but yeah. It's hard. I don't know a whole second language. Most people in I America don't. I know one don't. language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Are you, are you uh, tattooing down there in Austin too? Um, or just hanging out? I think this time we're going to just be hanging out. Like, I have the Sunday 
it was like it's like a maybe but it's also like i don't really when i go to places like dallas like i'm seeing the distance between here and the hotel <laughs> so i think it's like and dylan was like take a couple of days off so i can actually go and do something with yeah him. yes that'd be yeah. good yeah. yeah i feel like that's always tough when you guest spot because you want to like work every day but then people come all the time and they're like yeah i didn't schedule any time to like see anything i was just working the whole time right. yeah. yeah so besides poetry how how many days a week do you tattoo two to three Mm -hmm. When I'm in LA and when I do guest spots, like I'll go somewhere and I, like, will hammer out like six to seven in a row, and then. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I choose to take summers lighter, and when winter time I'll tattoo more. But I just I want to have the summer of love and mm -hmm. just like adventure, and I guess it comes with heartache too. But I've so far just had such a profoundly beautiful six months that have been also extremely tragic in its own sense but mm. I think I am just enjoying feeling the emotions and being okay feeling the emotions and it's inspired me to write so bring it <laughs> yeah. yeah awesome and I'm sorry there's been a little tragedy too yeah but you seem to have a great attitude moving forward and it can inspire you. My dad always says, like, um, don't lay in the fire. And if that's how it is, like, bad mm -hmm. things happen. But it's like, do things can be true at the same time. You can be extremely upset and hurt by something. And it can also be good. And you can be proud. And you can be at peace with it. Yeah. yeah. So I think if you feel your feelings and don't try to run away from it, it helps you go through it. And it's made me write mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone go on threads. <laughs> oh, God. Ooh. <laughs> so, uh, that's where you can find her writings. Yeah. Does it, so does that, but does that help you, like, process things, too, when you write that's it out? That's a good question. They're just, like, little love poems. They're, like, little love letters. Like, two-sentence love letters. Yeah. Are they towards anyone in particular, towards yourself? Um, I found some old writings as well. Yeah. And so like those, I just a mixture of things. Some of them are definitely about one individual particular, but mm -hmm. I think it's just like the overall, like love and loss and you know. Yeah. I love to say love along lost and stories of other woe. So if someone wants to get tattooed by you, What's the best way for them to do so? Um, I have a lot of people sending me. I opened my, I didn't take DMs for the longest time, mm -hmm. but now I realize that we're just in the era of instant gratification yeah. and DMs work a lot. I do prefer when people go onto my website at sarahfable.com and there's um, the menu that says tattoos and then tattoo inquiries. And then you can, on my website, you can read my rates because I charge a little differently. I I have a custom rate, which is when you tell me what you want, you're very specific in what you want, that's okay. Here's the rate for it. And then there's the portfolio designs where you give me more freedom in what I want to do. Mm. And that's $1,000 less a day, which is mm. a significant um, um, discount. And then I also give multi-day discounts. So like, if you're like, oh, your rates are really high, but I'm like, if you give me more freedom and you do a larger piece, your hourly rate actually gets very low. Like I would say lower than majority of people that are in my like expertise level. Yeah. And that's just so that everybody has the access to designs and it encourages larger pieces. Yeah. Um, so all that price breakdown and what the difference is between custom portfolio, all of that is very transparent. It's on my website. Mm. And there's also a booking form that you can fill. Awesome, very cool. good to know. Yeah. yeah cool. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for coming. Um, it was good kind of getting to know your story and everything. You've been around for a while and I was um, I was curious. Yeah, hopefully I'll come back here again. I have lots of fun clients in Texas and I do like Texas. So yeah. good. Yeah. Good. I wanna do one of your seminars. Oh yeah. Yeah. Make me do some color stuff. <laughs> oh my <laughs> Woof. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
the scary. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to add or ask or say? Just take care of each other. Mm -hmm. I think as we get older, we realize how infinite the amount of people that we really connect with and the good people, like the people in this industry that make us feel happy. And, and I think this is the time and space in the world that even if you want to just comment one happy little thing and encourage your fellow artists, like that one comment you post on my account saying like, oh my God, like you look so pretty or like, oh, I love this tattoo, this is so well made. That goes a long way. You yeah. have no idea if that artist struggled posting that design because they didn't feel good enough. Mm. And then you post into it that one encouraging comment that can really turn the course of your mental self-worth and mental mm -hmm. health and i think we should just all do it a little bit more yeah that's totally yeah that's yeah. a great message yeah well thank you all so much for tuning in until yeah. next time <laughs>